Good evening, brothers and sisters. Peace be with you all as normal. And may the Lord guide you and keep you. As I have been on a break from my typical schedule uh, for the past month, I would say, I have missed making videos, and this video is changing the format up quite a bit. I'm not using my normal camera. It's dead, but it's charging, and that's the story. I'm using my trusty old webcam, which I didn't get a whole lot of use out of. Now that I think of it, uh, from an SD, um, I think I used, for an SD I used it once or so. Um, so this video is impromptu, I got an idea and I'm just playing with the lighting, so bear with me. Um, I don't know if this video will turn out black and white. Uh, that's become sort of my signature, but uh, it doesn't matter really either way. I've been getting more into archery, and my two bows are behind me. So um, you can see that. Uh, like I said, different uh, angle, format, whatever. And. I will get back to my normal way as soon as I can. So, already wasted two minutes, um, but I had found a verse that sticks out to me a lot. Um, one that uh, is very profound in its simplicity, which a lot of times profound things are quite s simple uh, realizations. You may think, oh, why didn't I think of that? But it's in the Wisdom of Solomon, which if you are, I don't know, um, you don't have an apocrypha in your Bible, then you won't know about the wisdom of Solomon, most likely. Um, if you are not Orthodox or even, I think, Catholic, I don't think the Roman Catholics have wisdom of Solomon, though. Um, but I think it was Solomon. Maybe it was Sirach, um, or Sirach, I'm not sure how to say it. Let's see. It was Wisdom of Sirach, which um, both these books, Wisdom of Solomon and of Sirach, respectively, are written from the perspective of Jews, who they're named after, uh, the writers, um, Jesus ben Sirach and Solomon, somebody of the uh, first century BC, so, or second century, rather. BC for Wisdom of, Sol of Sirach and Wisdom of Solomon is actually 30 to 10 BC, according to this, which I trusted. <laughs> so, it's Wisdom of Sirach, verse 1, 1 through 1. <laughs> it's just the very first verse, two short lines. Um, one sentence, and it says, All wisdom comes from the Lord and is with him forever. 
And the first time I read that, it, as I said, it was very simple, but so profound. I realized finally in reading that that wisdom and thus a true sense of understanding only come from the Lord, capital L, who is Christ. Back then, you could argue they knew who Christ was, but not in the sense that we do now thanks to the, the ascension of God and his life, crucifixion, and resurrection. Um, back then, there was a time of betweenness when this was written, when there was uncertainties for sure. Um, and then even during and just before and after Christ's time on earth, um, very violent and um, upsetted, upset time uh, in the Middle East, um, Judea, um, Palestine, what, what have you. So They're writing from that um, perspective, and I think the, actually the, this is a study Bible, it's the Orthodox Study Bible, um, it doesn't say a lot about the uh, setting or the time, but Jews were very not quite different from Christians, um, especially into the the early church. Um, the Jewish roots are undeniable, but uh, they focus on the word and the law. And it got me to thinking in reading this one verse that to truly be fulfilled in life uh, and have wisdom, to be sure, is to know the Lord. That seems obvious to Christians and to the Jews of the time, and I'm sure to the Jews now. However, a lot of the time we get caught up in the world and really forget that. But it is so simple. You know, to think that our true fulfillment will be from Christ Jesus, not anything or anyone else, especially anyone else. There is only one who will save us, redeem us, which could be the same thing, um, to make our lives complete in the afterlife to give us life then and now. So it's on to eternity that only Christ can offer. Um, and the wisdom part, I think, is that realization. First and foremost, which that realization, I would say, comes from the Lord. And the reason I talk about this is because the reason for making the video is to I wanted to discuss my journey to faith, true faith, in a way that was simple, but it turns out that uh, I do take, I know this, I take longer time in my videos to discuss things, and there are a lot of side things to note, side stories, and connections to be made, but I will try to keep it concise and short, also because it is currently late, but I feel it has to be said, because that's why I make videos uh, for a purpose, even if I don't fully understand it, or my worldly mind 
takes over and thinks that it's pointless. Someone will find some value of it at some point in the future. So my background is in the United Methodist Church founded by John Wesley originally. Uh, the UMC wasn't officially started until 1968, whereas John Wesley and his brother Charles lived in the mid to late 18th century, so 1700s, and that's what I know about them. Um, they were English, and in and around London, I think it was, maybe Oxford as well, but England, nonetheless, and they, John particularly, is well known, not only to Methodists, but Christians in general who care to study or read or whatever, they'll come across him at some point, or his quotes, and he taught that the uh, thing about prevenient grace um, and sanctification through means of faith, of course, and grace, um, grace through faith, a common Protestant theme, a common Christian belief in general, and the prevenient grace was, is, said to be the grace that was there before a person knew the Lord, before they even heard the gospel. Uh, it basically was there from the beginning, and it enables each person to come to a full faith in Christ when the time is right. But God is there before, and He's obviously acting on it, everyone's lives, but he has that type of grace for them before they even know it. So it's kind of an interesting um, aspect of Wesleyan theology, and it's pretty logical and straightforward when you simplify it down to that, and that's what I know about it, is that it was there before, and it, it, it enables the person to come to the full grace, I guess, the sanctifying grace. So there are different types of grace in Wesleyan theology. And how this ties into my story is that I would say I'd agree with preventing grace in that every human being is capable of coming to faith in the Lord. That's very obvious. If we were not, well, there would be no point really to him dying on the cross for everybody, uh, rising from the dead, conquer death. That would be, it would be, it could happen, but what we'd have to assume then is the Calvinist root, and that is the idea of predestination. Um, or selective grace, or um, there's another word for it, they prefer to predestination because it describes how um, how God bestows salvation on, on the elect instead of the general population. But I do think that and I think Presbyterians especially, the churches who still have some the Calvinist roots do not emphasize that so much. Um, and if they do still believe that, uh, in election, if you will, by God, then the idea is if someone is saved in the end, it's because of God's will that they were, which makes perfect sense too. However, 
it can cut out free will if you take it to its extreme end by saying they have no choice, which is what Calvin was saying. Like I said, it's not as emphasized now, and I don't know how many people actually still truly would say that humans don't have exactly that free will, although as I say that, I can think of certain groups that would. For example, that's why you see free will Baptist churches. Um, they emphasize free will of humans, as do others, Wesleyans, Methodists, uh, the Holiness Movement, Pentecostals, uh, Evangelicals in general, Roman Catholics, we Orthodox, understand that there's free will for the human to choose. So, back to the preventing grace, I could agree with that, in that God could initiate that a person to realize the truth and turn to Christ. And that is very simple because God is infinite and has his own will, and he can do that easily. But the free will of the human comes in and may neglect that, ignore it, maybe acknowledge it and just ignore it, or may not notice because they're, the person is so caught up in the world, which happens to a lot of people, unfortunately. From what I would from my observance, I know people that, for whatever reason, they just do not care to to conform to the belief. They feel that their way is better. They just have it right, and so they don't need anything else but themselves, their mind, whatever the world offers, and so they choose not to be a Christian, so to speak. Maybe because they don't care for the the faith itself, they don't like religion and whatnot. So that's where I was for a time. I stopped being a Christian and I never consider myself a Methodist per se because for one I didn't understand what that meant fully um, now I know that I won't be something if I cannot fully uh, I would say agree with it and that's why I found orthodoxy so appealing per se from a human standpoint, is that I did agree with, do agree with a lot of what is taught. But that's only one aspect. You see, faith is more than just that one layer of agreeing with some teachings, but it's a further faith life and a renewing of the soul that is necessary. If you just agree with what they say, and don't have anything deeper, well then it's, it might as well be politics. You may get fired up about it, you may feel something about it, but it, it's no more than subscribing to some rule or mandate or, or ideology. And that is not what I want orthodoxy to be from my experiences with people, orthodox people. I have yet to see that. I have yet to see someone who just says, yes, I'm going to stick to these rules. It's never like that. Um, and maybe someday I will um, meet someone like that. I wouldn't doubt that there are those people, but I have yet to see it. And I've attended, I've gone to five Orthodox parishes, five. In comparison, 
I attended three, four Methodist churches. Okay. Five. So the same amount, actually. Uh, which is surprising, um, comparing the amount of time. But I've been around, and I, I've, I'm old now. I can, I can drive, and I go to the other parishes and, and whatnot. But I, I honestly have yet to find someone who's just dry or whatever. They actually have a reason to be there. They want to be there, regardless of what people may, on the outside may think, seeing Greek Orthodox Church or whatever, think, oh, it's, it's, a, it's an ethnic club. <laughs> it's much more than that. There's that aspect. You have the fellowship, there's going to be Greek food, dancing, etc., which is, is fun and good, in my opinion, but it's not just that. Uh, so it's about the, the faith there, the life in the church that comes first always. So that's a comforting thing to think, um, to see. And the passion and devotion that people have in the Orthodox Church is impressive to me. And that is another aspect of why I, I, like why I stay. So there was that layer of agreement with certain teachings, and then that layer of the richness of the congregations, if you will, the other people. Not that they don't have issues or anything, but the faith rules those two things. It overrules those. So on the third level, there's that spiritual experience, and that's probably the top layer. And the one that fuels my life, even outside of the parish doors, the church doors, that is the fullness. And that is everything, really. Um, so we have the three layers. Um, I always like coming up with these parts. I've done this in another video where I, I talk about a topic and I came up with three or three different keys or something and put it together. But um, that's why I would call it the, it may be a hierarchy even of the faith, of faith in general, why you go to a certain denomination, if you will, um, and why people stay. Those are important things. So, into story mode, um, as I left the Methodist faith, I, I said I wouldn't go back to Christianity. Uh, I'm sure I was, I thought I, I was really not going to go back. But in that time of probably four or five months, or rather two months or three months of non-faith, trying to be an atheist, a lot of issues came up. And really I should say agnostic, per se. But um, anxiety started. I actually had at least one panic attack, which was surprising to me at the time. It, it came out of nowhere. So looking back, I can say that was definitely a symptom of my new worldview. <laughs> but when I did decide to be Orthodox, which if you were familiar or a friend of mine on Facebook, I did post a video two years ago, and I can't believe it's been two full years. It was, it's actually now close to two months ago, two years ago, or actually a month ago, two years ago, where I 
kind of have said I would look into orthodoxy and attending liturgy and whatnot. But it wouldn't be for another full year after that that I actually, as I it was clarified to me, would come to the faith. And then even still, another month until I attended liturgy. So there were definitely times where I had the inkling of orthodoxy and then a seed planted and it would take time, a year, before it sprouted and then a month before it kind of was growing and then another year after that until I was pretty certain, maybe not a full year, but the way it went was the very first discovery of orthodoxy was in 2013, late 2013, and that's an estimate because, sorry, it might have been late 2012. I actually had my first instance of reading about, very brief, about what orthodoxy the hierarchical uh, positioning of orthodoxy and compared to Rome and whatnot, uh, the split, the schism, and like I said, the hierarchical um, structure with the ecumenical patriarch and so on in the orthodox church. And at the time, I, I honestly didn't think much of it. And it took another year after that where I think more was was sort of revealed and I do not have any recollection of that which would have been fall of 2013 and then 2014 is when I really I think I, I bought my cross in either I think it was fall 2014 I've been wearing it daily, near, near, probably two full years now, almost. Um, it might have been summer of 2013, but regardless, the year of 2014, the years of 2014 and 15 were times of that continual growth, a, a curiosity of orthodoxy that would later sprout into on my way to being on my way to um, conversion and so I guess the overall message of this is that it started from nothing it started from a complete getting rid of what was to really nothing But for some reason, that peace was still there, and I didn't quite uproot it enough. And I think it was that first layer of truly, actually, I agreed with what the beliefs were, even if I didn't know it at the time. So, back to prevenient grace. God had that in me, probably forever, but I had to discover it. And so, he can turn, he can use anybody, and he can bring them the truth. And that's the end goal, of course. But the point of life and the wisdom, the actual wisdom, all of it comes from the Lord. So we have to be open to the what ifs, you know. What if it is true? Um, people have a lot of doubts and then they look start just focusing on those those main things oh I don't agree with the church's stance on this I don't agree with you know what they say about same-sex marriage or whatever the politics um, because same-sex marriage is a huge one and they overlook it they they just disregard 
and they don't look at that they don't feel the fullness of the faith or they get caught up on some other thing like I don't like beards <laughs> you know this is it's a ridiculous example but it could be oh it's too flashy or showy and why do they have paintings of, of Mary you know why why do they kiss those paintings and there's not an understanding of it why don't they greet me at the beginning of the service why is it called liturgy and not service what's going on or even better yet why why is there another language being spoken they get caught up on those levels and I truly believe that if we're all willing to skip that for a while and look and feel into the the faith as its mystical and spiritual aspects because it is spiritual capital S the spirit guides it um, it will blow us away and I think that's what happened with me because I would have easily gotten hung up on ethnicity and you know Greek or whatever I mean now I'm just dealing with that and understanding that people are people and they have their quirks and, and problems. I've had to actually understand that and go through that processing. But it hasn't uh, swayed me a lot, maybe a little, but from the faith itself, every time I think, why don't I just go for the Roman Catholic Church why don't I just it's easier it's local it's everywhere it's oh there are more resource resources that books and, and options and priests and parishes all over the world not really but for the most part and yet I get back to what truly matters and that's this wisdom that Sirach is talking about here all wisdom comes from the Lord and the that's the fact of the matter wisdom is the faith it's not like because if it were wisdom in earthly terms you know street smarts or whatever even book smarts well anyone can do that if they set their mind to it but he's talking about wisdom and oddly enough, this study Bible tells it that wisdom has a little um, footnote on that verse. It says that wisdom is Christ himself, which is very another profound thing to think, oh, that's Christ, you know. And it's all about acquiring the Holy Spirit. You acquire Christ through the Spirit and He lives in and through you when you allow free will. Look back to free will. And so it all really ties in with that idea of prevenient grace. Everyone can have it. Everyone can have that. Everyone can be a, could be a saint. Now will they be or will is it Maybe it's not God's will. Well, then not everyone can be in the end. But there is still... And I think being a saint is actually... It is the human will, too. But it's cooperation with God. So that's why I think everyone could be a saint. And the whole living the, the life of a true Christian everyone can do and so we shouldn't get caught up on those like I said those first two sort of or actually the first layer of values or kind of the even political stances if you will it's, it's a lot like politics you know like I said same-sex marriage abortion these big issues and people get caught up on those, you know, instead of going straight to, you know, 
what their soul would be drawn to. And it's unfortunate, but that's what I, I think happens. This is my this is my theory on all this. And with me, there was nothing really. Um, my social views had changed somewhat, but not really. I didn't harp on them. And the funny thing is, they even carried over into when I decided to look into orthodoxy more. I had a Christians for LGBT rights page I had made, which is no longer in my um, curation, if you will. Yes, if that's the word. Um, where, you know, it's for LGBT rights, um, civil rights, and it took a year later for them to get the marriage ticket from the Supreme Court in the US, of course, but I was orthodox, yet I hadn't even changed that aspect. I didn't, I didn't think that homosexuals should change their their ways or their thinking or their their urges uh, manage them I just thought they should just be treated like everyone else um, or they should be able to be civilly married or whatever but I still was so I felt the faith now over time my views adjusted and they became more in line with the the scripture, the church, the faith. So it's kind of interesting that that you know what I'm saying. I was first in the faith, in the spiritual and mystical aspect. I was drawn in, and then everything else aligned. And now it's very. It makes more sense, obviously, but it's more almost um, unified faith and mind values in one, of course. But the faith led that charge forward, the mystical aspect. So that was the top layer first, and then those two other layers catching up. The second layer, the social and not social issues, but uh, fellowship I've been working on. And through God's grace, truly, I've gotten out of my comfort zone and have really enjoyed people's company who are a great blessing to those around them. And even though they may have their personal deficits as I do and everyone does and struggles and whatnot, um, that's not what matters about them. But they are Christians, we're all one in Christ. We share in the struggle and the life. So that is catching up to the top, um, the mystical aspect, the spiritual aspect, and then the bottom one has caught up, but those around me are on the other end of the spectrum, so I'm accepting the church. Um, those and and um, the politics is a struggle still, and I don't think there's a way around that. So I vow to be apolitical. Um, I have my thoughts on politics, and I've talked about that I think a couple times. So I'm not going to dive into that. But while I'm talking, I kind of wanted to talk about an issue that is very much on everybody's minds because it's just so prevalent and that is sexuality and I mentioned it already same-sex marriage marriage um, unions activity whatever and the there's really no good way to talk about it 
without causing some upheaval of uh, emotions and I don't I don't know it's it's just it's so div divisive and very it's just heated you either have sort of a stance one way or the other there's not a lot of middle ground really um, and it's just it's it's tough so but it's been on my mind lately and the reason is that actually I had found out that the United Methodist Church elected its first openly gay bishop which is against the book of doctrines or discipline or whatever they have and I wondered how that could happen it's completely against the church's stance and what it will allow I just don't know I can't wrap my mind around how that logistically would work it's a complete usurping of the the church and what they vowed and it it came from San Francisco it's that district jurisdiction or whatever they call it a district um, and this woman is married or uni unified whatever to a woman and it's so hard for me to understand that because I grew up in that that denomination and I never thought that would actually happen and they have married pastors of married people again married people and have gotten in trouble for it several pastors now and that's unfortunate and it's it also that goes against the church completely as well as being openly gay and a pastor even but a bishop she made it to bishop don't know how it happened so that got the years turning once more about all this junk and I have to come back to that wisdom as many Methodists would say it's just wrong okay it's against the scripture it's against the what our rules have been our beliefs have been established probably since Wesley and it's just it's wrong on every level uh, there's no there's nothing good um, that it's just wrong you know at each point the only right thing is that people elected her to be that in that position someone did and that's fair but it goes against it's not it's not right if it goes against what the rules are and the more than rules doctrine of the, the institution or whatever so it's just so it throws everything for a loop if that were to happen in my church in the church that Christ established uh, it wouldn't but if somehow it were to because you never know um, the it, it would not continue there'd be huge ramifications which are not for some reason I went back a few days after and then a week after it happened and then I think it's getting on two weeks now and there's there's no word specifically that oh she's out or whatever um, she's been kicked defrocked which she should have been a long time ago um, again I don't know if it's her, her district that takes care of that in which case they wouldn't do that to her because they agree with it but um, there's no ramifications it seems there's just outrage from other 
parts of the country and the world, I'm sure. But, as I said, in the Orthodox Church, it, it just, they wouldn't even be ordained if that were known that they were practicing in such a way, let's say, it just wouldn't happen, it would, it's like nipping in the bud, and there may be, and there were, there were saints, um, supposedly, I think it was Saint, um, Seraphim Rose, who was a monk, and I don't know a lot about Seraphim Rose, but he, I read, uh, somewhere, supposedly struggled with same-sex attraction, and forgive me if I'm wrong, because I, I don't know for sure, but I wouldn't be surprised, you know, but it's a passion that you fight. It's like pornography, and, and let's not get into too much details, but perverse things. Um, it's something you, a Christian should not take at face value and say, it's the way God made me. You know, and that's what it boils down to here is that a good safe bet is that if scripture says it's wrong to to act on it then having temptation to do it should it is your it's your struggle and even if scripture doesn't say it is wrong for example pornography we know it's wrong because of well you could look at it logically but what the doctrines of most churches, let's say, are. They say it's wrong, and they use scripture and show that it's wrong. And so, you should fight those temptations. Now, the issue here is the culture around the church. The culture says, the society says, if if you don't accept them for what they do, and you're hateful, a bigot, etc., you're afraid of it or of them, and that's what we have to deal with. Those are the cards we've been given, and when we disagree with it and, and stand for the truth that it is wrong, it should be combated in that each person should struggle against it. Um, as they say in the, the church, work out their salvation in f with fear and trembling, in fear and trembling, which is in awe of God, the mighty, the almighty, who says there's a better way. He made us to be born. He didn't make us to be, to be sinful. It just so happens that that's what that's what it is. It's that free will aspect again. He allows basically everything in in so much as we know to whatever extent that things do happen. It's because it was willed or allowed to happen. So. When people argue Christian, Christian practicing homosexuals or whatever, say this is the way God made me, why would he make me this way and then just label me a, a, a sinner and bound for hell or whatever, uh, that's not true. Um, he created you and he has his perfect will. If that includes a struggle against something for most or all of your life, or maybe not even all your life, maybe if you tried to change you would then you'd see that it, it's in your hands and that's the struggle because that's not what the society says and the society unfortunately trumps the faith any chance it gets it it will do that and then we 
and I'm going to use Orthodox Christians as the ones who stand for truth in this case, um, regardless of denomination or whatever. We are seen as haters and small-minded, regressive, etc., because we say that the act is wrong, there shouldn't be same-sex unions, marriages, um, I keep using air quotes because it's not marriage, okay? Um, never in the in the scriptures do you see same-sex marriage. You do see, I will admit, and when the liberal people of our society use this, they say, well, you're always saying that marriage is between a man and woman, but Leviticus says this, and um, Deuteronomy has this, Genesis and has this, where Solomon had, and Solomon had all these wives, concubines even, and all this blah, 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 blah. And they forget that Christ said that a man will leave his family and bind, uh, cling to his wife and become one flesh with her. They forget that for some reason, or just, just say, well, yeah, but look at the Old Testament. And... I'd like to say, do you, I'd like to ask, do you ever see it say that Solomon had 500 wives? Yes, but he had two husbands, or 500 husbands. No, uh, it, it wasn't conceived of that that would be, they may, they may have, someone thought of it back then, but it just wasn't, and it isn't. It's not the design, it doesn't work like that. Um, and that is the way it is. Tough luck. So when people say, well, you know, it, it causes no harm or whatever, it, it's just, it doesn't matter if it doesn't cause immediate harm to somebody or something. It's, it, it's that, it's just not the way it's supposed to be. And if you're not Christian, you won't see that. But that's the way it is. And so it's not marriage. It's something else. It's a civil contract. Two people living together. Um, which there's nothing wrong with two men living together. But it's more than that. And we know it. And so, it, but it's not marriage. Okay, no matter what the state will say, they really have no say of actual marriage. And that's what a lot of Christians would like, myself included, to where the government gets out of marriage and allows it to the institutions that perform marriage and what that would do is change the tax laws and stuff, but um, it leaves it to us. So the Orthodox Church does not have to uh, acknowledge same-sex marriage. Not that we do now anyway, we don't. It's not marriage, as I keep saying. Um, it would just be up to each each group, not the government. And I think that it, it could be fine doing it that way. But ultimately, I don't really... It's not something I, I think about a lot, but lately it has been. And frankly, it's gotten out of hand. The whole LGBT everything. It's just gone way out of hand. It's gone too far, and it, it just continues. Um, we have to see where it goes. What I do know is that there is some want to change every church in this country, every denomination, to what they want. 
and it's quite eerie, I guess. Um, I'm thinking that 20 to 50 years, you know, anywhere from there, even 10, the rate that society, how quickly things change. It's up in the air um, in a lot of ways, but in this way, especially, we just have to see where it goes. And that's just obvious, uh, as with anything. But those are my thoughts on this, these kinds of things, the three layers of faith and then the going from atheist to full belief and the prevenient grace of God is he is there before we are is an interesting idea and then the homosexual arguments and unions and that is the video um, I have been somewhat busy lately and just getting back into making videos this is sort of a follow-up to last year's video of sort of the similar style where I talked for actually an hour and a half I think so go back and watch a little bit of that one to see the progression if you will what has changed and what hasn't um, it's it's been interesting I, I, w I always pray that everyone I know will come to Christ and so far that hasn't happened <laughs> but I do try to lead by example as well and if you've made it this far in the video and watch, I hope you can agree with that. If not, I don't know what to say. Um, I do have strong beliefs and opinions, and I know you do too. So that's the way it is. But if we leave those for a while behind and go to that faith zone, if you will, uh, the mystical realities of the universe, of what truly is, that wisdom, which is from the Lord, and it says forever, amazing things happen. I've seen it in my life. I've heard about it in others, and I don't know. Um, really, it always comes down to there's truth and there's untruth and you have to decide every day what you'll go towards so that's it um, thank you for watching I hope the Lord will bless you and lead you and of course um, change your mind your heart and soul to what is right and I think that's it. I'll wrap it up. Different format for this video. Look for the next videos. Maybe more archery stuff too. Um, gameplays, sure. We'll do all that a little bit. Um, looking towards the podcast. Um, I might do that at some point once I get more organize on what I want to do and talk talk about in each episode and all that to make it a regular thing and I don't know if there's anyone left to really download them or know about them and, and listen uh, I'm looking to get more viewers more people to talk to talk with I have some ideas but we'll have to see so that's all for this episode of an STTV and I am saying thank you and good night. Peace be with you all.